Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 210, also known as 210, aka Dos Uno Zero, Dos Uno Zero, hola, buenos dias, all of my friends. Hope you guys are doing well, you well hydrated, well rested and stuff, it's now what thursday or something thursday morning it's um looking quite cloudy out there i'm assuming it's going to be some kind of rainstorm some sort of thunderstorm some sort of windstorm the windstorm exists or is that not a thing that's probably not a thing but there's going to be something happening in those skies up above but you probably won't see it because you're glued to your bloody phones you are these little devices here you're glued to them you're looking down you're not looking up so you're going to get rained upon and you will be none the wiser and then your flipping gadget that you pray over and that you love more than your actual family will end up dying then you end up crying then because it's the middle of the month you don't have any money to replace it then you'll be sad and then and then and then and then and then but you can fix all that if you just look up and you're like, oh my God, it's going to rain. I should buy an umbrella. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm probably a little bit fatigued this morning. Um, I've had a bit of a crazy week, working out a bunch, working a bunch, um, doing a bunch of these and just generally, you know, a bit run down. But we're going to keep persisting. Keep persisting. Um, yesterday, yesterday I did two workouts in one day, right? One before work, one after work. I went for a run in the morning, I did 10 200 meter repeats, then I came back after work and I did five, no, I did like four sets of deadlifts and shit, some overhead presses, bench pressing, and then went home. So I'm absolutely aching. And then tonight, I'm going to go for a long run again. So I'm just putting in all the work, all the work ahead of my trip this weekend. Because, you know, I sometimes, I like to batch in work. I don't know if it actually works, actually physiology, 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 physiologically. Physiologically? How do you say that word? <laughs> How do you say that word? I don't know. Anyway, I don't know if it works, right? I'm not sure if it works. But I like to batch in my workouts if I'm going away on an extended break over the weekend because I'm not going to have any time to do it, right? Because I, 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 I've been that guy who's kind of gone away over the weekend, taken some running gear with them, and then realized, you know what? I could be that guy that's going to go for a run, but I don't want to socially disturb this evening that we have going on. Right, because when you go and stay at people's houses, you have to ask the guests if you can then borrow their key, and they ask you why. And then you can say you're running. They're gonna be like, "Oh my god, you're crazy!" And it's that same conversation again, right? So there's no like real back, you know. I think if I was, if we were staying in a hotel, I would I would have brought my stuff with me because there would have been no hassle. I was taking the room key with me and just kind of gone out for a quick run. But staying with people or staying in an Airbnb is a bit strange. Even in Airbnb is fine. You got your own set of keys, but staying with friends it gets a bit awkward. And in general, too, I just don't want to be the oh, where is your Where's your guy? Oh, he's out running. You know what I mean? It just comes across a little bit wanky. So I'm just going to allow it for the weekend, right? I'm going to mine out, chill out, because it's actually, I've got five days of working out, which is quite good, right? And then when I come back, I'm going to start again. So everything should be fine and dandy. So yeah, um, two workouts in a day. I'm really feeling, I'm strained. I'm really feeling tired and run down. I don't know how these professional athletes do it. But I think if you're a professional athlete, it's probably a lot easier for you, easier because you're not working nine to five, right? You're having to concentrate. Maybe it's harder though, isn't it? Having to focus only on gym and what you're eating, that stuff. It must be a lot more fatiguing mentally and physically too. But anyway, I guess if you're working a full-time job and you're trying to, churn, trying to train twice a week or twice a day, it gets really difficult really, really quickly. I remember there being a good trend about that recently in, in CrossFit. There's a big trend about um because I think for a while, not nowadays, because now CrossFit sort of evolved and the athletes are essentially professional athletes, even if they don't get paid or compensated the way professional athletes should do, they're essentially are professional athletes. But in the beginning there were a lot of um kind of stay at home moms, a lot of retired cops, a lot of working police officers, um, a lot of um students, just weird range of people who are like really killing it in the games, right? And being able to balance, imagine being a stay-at-home mum and then you're still kind of man managing to get your odd wad in every, every, you know, every hour of the day when you're free or whatever it may be. But nowadays you can't do that. You have to be fully in. You can't have one foot out, one foot in and try and progress through um, into the regionals or even into the CrossFit game. It's just not going to work for you. Um, so I guess that's where really the elite comes. If you want to be a 5% or a 1% in your class, you have to kind of commit to it. But I guess if I'm just trying to maintain some level of good physical fitness and make sure I've got a slivet and slim enough body to fit into all the designer clothes I want to wear because I've got a pretty big frame. So if I get bigger, I can't wear stuff. But if I get 
slimmer than I can get away with wearing a larger on XL and designer clothing. Even though my frame is quite wide, I can still get away with it in terms of sizing and stuff. But I just need to have a more of a slimmer silhouette. So if, if I'm just worried about that really aesthetically, and I'm maybe there's some health benefits attached to it that are going to help me as well in my day to day life, especially when it comes to DJing, standing up for four and a half hours plus in a nightclub, it helps to be fit and healthy, then so be it. But anything else above that i have to really start to consider my occupation and what i'm actually here for in general i mean that's not my role or goal at all um what else is happening with me um oh yeah so today i was was thinking just randomly about advice right and i think i was thinking about advice based um solely upon this book that i'm still reading now um which I've recommended to you guys, I think on here before a couple of times, um, it's called uh, Digital Minimalism. Why isn't that showing up properly? I don't know why it's doing that. It doesn't let me show it up. But it's this book here. It's called Digital Minimalism, Digital Mini, Mini, Digital Minimalism, right? Uh, screen mirroring. What's screen mirroring do? Does that work? If it, let me see if I can screen mirroring stuff works. I can maybe load it up on here on the screen. Looking for an Apple TV. Have I got an Apple TV or have I got a normal TV? I think I've got a normal TV, haven't I? I don't know what that is. Maybe it's not gonna work. I don't know. Will you work? Come on. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There's a book called um, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. I actually get it up here on the screen for you guys to see. Da, 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 da. Digital Minimalism. Uh, Cal Newport. <laughs> Ba, ba, ba. So there's this book that I'm reading right here. It's not the same cover. I've got a different cover. The cover that I've got has like a little USB cable that's ripped, which is this one there. Right? Which is this one here. Can you see that one? It's that one. But anyway, this book essentially is something that's got me thinking about advice, right? In in digital minimalism, Cal Newport argues that, you know, we are way too attached to our digital devices, we are way too attached to social media, and we don't take enough time to be alone with our own thoughts, to be quote unquote bored, um, to consider the direction of our lives, and to generally be more connected to the world and around us outside of our digital gadgets and our social media. Um, he also argues that social media platforms and tech companies have kind of sold us this lie that they actually enabling us to connect or to broaden our community or to get to know people like you know from all walks of life but essentially what they're doing is that they are cutting us off from our immediate community people in amongst in and around us who actually need our physical um presence right when you know in conversation or mentally for us to be there and not be wondering and kind of checking on our phone and stuff and there's a section in the book where he says something along the lines of um we've lost kind of the ability to think through issues to think through things to really kind of get to the core of an issue and to give ourselves good advice right which is kind of made me think and i kind of added onto it and thought you know what maybe that's why there's such a prevalence and such a need these days for self-help gurus right because a self-help guru um in the kind of layman sense is going to help you answer the questions of your life that you haven't quite figured out yet right they're going to somehow provide you with a path or with a methodology or an ideology or a mindset or a set of practices or some steps or some practical tips that you can then apply to your own life in order to get to the place that you want to get to achieve your dreams or to become a better person blah 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 I was thinking maybe that's why there's such a prevalence of it and that's maybe why such people are so um um so ready to absorb things from self-help gurus to biblical preachers to sorry, religious preachers wherever they may be to people on tv shows and stuff they're very um willing to sit down there and hear somebody else tell them what they should do with their life instead of actually reflecting on what maybe they should do with their own life right the reason why i say that is because most of the time no the reason why i say that to get a bit of context is that when i was growing up and then when i was a kid especially in school i was always kind of um referred to or I was always kind of um, spoken about as a person who would give good advice, right? Um, oh, go to Agassino. You know, he'll he'll get he'll give you some good advice. He'll know what to say. Um, he's probably gonna have something intelligent to say about it. He probably have might have a good idea. And then obviously, when you're young, it can kind of be a good thing for your ego. It kind of gives you a bit of pat on the back. You feel quite important. You feel you feel intelligent and stuff. But the older you get, the more you start to really question how smart you are or how much of what they're saying is bs and if the smoke they're blowing up your ass is real or not because the older you become the more you start to realize that you know what i don't even have my own stuff in order right why would anyone want to hear about what i have to say it doesn't make any sort of sense right it's like taking advice from so that's about taking diet dietary advice from somebody that's clinically obese doesn't make any sort of sense right they've not proven that they can 
get their own health in check or in order? Why would they suddenly have the right or have the reverence or have the audience to tell people what else, what they should do? So I kind of felt the same sort of way. And then over time, I started to realize that what actually happens is that when people are asking you for advice, they're not asking you really for advice. They're just asking you to say what they're already thinking most of the time. Especially if it's your friend. If, you have, if you've ever realized it, if your friend's asking you for advice and you tell them the brutal, honest truth, sometimes it can really go a long way to breaking or ending that relationship. Because people don't really want to hear the truth. They just want to hear you say what they're thinking in their subconscious. And then they'll be like, oh yeah, true, you've got a point. And why do they, people say you've got a point? Because usually it's something they've already been thinking about themselves. So I think digital minimalism, what's that's kind of so far what I've learned from the book is that this idea of like cutting yourself away from cutting yourself off from social media or allowing or putting social media or smartphones back in the box of it being a tool and it not being something that rules your life because that's especially i think the general premise of the of the whole uh, book is that when steve jobs first introduced the iphone he introduced it more so as an ipod that also makes calls right but now it's turned into this other thing right it's turned into this kind of all-consuming um media platform especially when you say you have imagine if you're the kind of guy that doesn't have a laptop or you only use your work laptop and you don't you have your smartphone, you've got Netflix on there, you've got your social media accounts, you've got your messaging accounts. All your life is consumed on this digital device. So there's no real, you know, there's no real chance for you to look up smother the, the, the trees, understand where you are, and make a rational decision about your future. It doesn't exist. So you, if anything, you're going to look for the quickest and easiest answer. Self-help gurus, YouTube video, a self-help book, whatever it may be, motivational speech. And of course, those things are fleeting because they don't really get to the core of what the issue is. And who, who, who knows the core of the issue? You. No one else has any other insight about it than you yourself. But nowadays, I think we distract ourselves to the point where, and sometimes I think it's on purpose. We do it purposely because I think life can be quite harsh. Life can be quite brutal. Uh, life can be unforgiving. So the last thing you want to do is confront your demons and really face up to the issues at hand really kind of answer or ask yourself some poignant questions, reveal some home truths that you've been trying to avoid. You don't want that. So you kind of try and distract yourself as much as possible, similar to what people do when they drink or they, or they you know, abuse alcohol or abuse drugs, right? Some usually, it, sometimes it could be because, you know, recreationally you just enjoy um, the feeling of getting high or getting blacked out drunk. But most of the time there is an underlying issue there where you're trying to avoid or run away or ignore something that you are know you need to address. But unfortunately, these issues don't go away. You wake up after a hangover and that issue is still there. So I think digital minimalism is going to be a hard thing for the public to embrace because I think at the heart of it, it goes down, it goes back to people actually understanding or acknowledging that they have an issue, which is something a lot of people don't want to say they have an issue about, right? Um, nowadays, people aren't bored anymore. Any kind of minute or second that passes by where you're idle, idling around, you can just quickly turn to your phone, um, browse something, check something, uh, you know, keep yourself stimulated that way. Um, I'm sure you can't remember the last article you read on the internet that really added anything to your life, but at the, at the time, they all seem like the most important thing to read. There's all these constructions happening, but I think it's going to take a long time for the public to really embrace digital minimalism. Because like I said, I think it's going to really strip away the issues that we're having. And again, I think in the book even mentions that um, some research has shown that the level of anxiety has gone up, you know, tenfold with some of the young people. And most of it has been attributed to smartphones, right? This idea of missing out, this idea of comparing yourself to people you probably shouldn't be comparing yourself to um, has kind of led kids to be anxious about the future, to be worried about things they probably shouldn't be worried about, to be involved in political movements or social change that is way, way, way above their level of understanding. Um, why so? Because they're anxious about everything. Everything's a life or death situation, whether it's the environment, politics, society in general, right? It's all kind of it's it, on, on the internet or social because they have to get you engaged. Everything feels like a life or death moment. Nothing feels, nothing's just a report as it is. Nothing's just a fleeting moment. Everything's like you have to listen to this right now. You gotta check this out. You'll never guess what he or she said. Um, so yeah, it got me thinking about advice and just in general, you know, the lack of advice I have had in my life in general um i don't really seek advice not because i'm smart because i don't really have a big social group and when i do get the advice it doesn't necessarily sit well with me it doesn't necessarily sound intelligent it doesn't necessarily sound reason it doesn't necessarily sound like it comes from a wide ranging it doesn't sound like it comes from like a you know a far pov it just sounds like someone just making a snap judgment or something you just told them when I try and take the time to kind of understand the issue at hand and try and make some kind of nuanced argument against it or for it, 
again, I'm not a whack. It's not to say that I'm better at it or anyone, but it's just, I don't know. And then, of course, the reason why I, I think like that is because, by and large, I have the answer for the most part. I know subconsciously what I should and shouldn't do, but I'm not willing or I'm not brave enough to face up to what I have to do to get there. So you kind of ignore it. You kind of put it to one side by delaying it. And the way you delay it, ask for advice. Hey, do you know what I should do about waste of time? Waste of bloody time. So, yeah, um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Advice for me is a weird one. It's always been a weird one for me. Like, how do you ask for it? When do you ask for it? When should you take it when it's given to you? Um, who do you go and ask? Is there a way to kind of rate their decision-making process over the years? Which, again, sounds mean, but it's the truth, right? Some people's advice does weigh differently than others. It's just a matter of fact. That's why people pay the big bucks to go see certain people talking Q&As and stuff, right? Because they value their advice more than others. It's just what it is. Um, I don't know. Strange, strange, strange place to be in. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. Kyle Newport, Digital Minimalism. It's out now in all good bookshops. I have it on an Audible. I have it on my iBooks account. So you can check it out on there as well. I recommend you check it. It's a really, really good book. Very eye-opening. It will have you questioning a lot of your own um, life choices and decisions you've made so far. Um, anyway, let's move on. Mm. Ba 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 ba. Got that water going. Got that good water going. Okay, cool. What should we do here? Um, what's the best first thing? Okay, first thing. Let's go into the. Let's go into the list. So number one. Annoyingly, when I was talking about Uber Air the other day, it didn't load up on the screen. Um, so I'm gonna go over it a little bit again, just because I was fascinated with, with it in general, anyway, and just kind of got my, you know, my spidey sense tingling in general. But yeah, I'm still fascinated by it. I don't think I'm ever gonna be not blown away by cool technology. I think nowadays, especially with everyone seemingly um, giving a shit, seeming, especially with everyone appearing to give more of a shit about societal issues that are way above their purview. Um, I think we've kind of um, not, we've kind of stopped being awed or like wowed by really cool gadgets or really cool bits of innovation. Something like you know SpaceX, Tesla Motors, um, the stuff that um, uh, Jeff Bezos is doing with his spaceship company. I forgot what it's called. The one that's going to the moon. We f we stop being we stop being awed by these things. But I think we shouldn't. I think we should still be thinking. You know what? Now we're living in some time, some of the best of times. We're seeing some amazing technological leaps, and some of these things are probably things we won't be able to see maybe in our generation. But for our kids, kids like they're going to live in a real, real crazy world. Like it's going to be similar to what we all thought um, it was, was going to happen when we used to watch the Jetsons back in the day, right? But it didn't, it didn't necessarily transpire that way. But it's kind of slowly but surely getting to that place. So this is Uber Air. It's Uber's solution to combating congestion in highly dense um, cosmopolitan cities. You know, um, it's the comes from that common phrase. I think, well, that phrase I've heard Elon Musk mention during his keynotes when you're talking about a boring company about our life being 3D, but our transport system being 2D, and the fact that going underground in tunnels are allowing it to be more of a 3D kind of you know destination um, routes, whatever maybe. So you can you can basically you can basically build more tunnels. Um, then you could do roads on top of each other and maybe with different destinations. So I'm assuming they want to do the same thing with um, the helipads and stuff on Uber. And Uber Air is kind of, I'm sure, I'm assuming aiming this more towards high flying executives who are, you know, who really value the amount of time they spend um, in transport, right? In public transport from going from place to place. Um, a, lot of their, a lot of their deals are dedicated about how quickly they can reply, how quickly they can get to a meeting. All that kind of time sensitive stuff. So, again, really interesting to look at. I'm not sure if it's something that everyone will be comfortable to use. Um, essentially, if you're listening via YouTube, it looks like a drone that you'd see people use when they're doing their filmings and stuff. Um, it looks like a really large drone. It looks autonomous as well to me. It kind of flies off of um, various um, helipads around the city. I'm assuming they're doing that because they won't be able to get permission from run from um, run from airport runways. Um, the aviation um, budget policies are super, super strict. I'd imagine so. So the easiest way to do is maybe to partner up with buildings and get them to kind of lease out their telepads that aren't probably in use as much as they should be and get them to use it that way. But visually, it's a stunning thing. The cockpit looks really nice and really clean. Um, it looks autonomous to me. Might not be autonomous. Maybe there will be a driver for safety reasons just in case it does fail and they could then kind of go back into manual control. The aircraft itself looks beautifully designed. Um, 
propellers on the back, propellers on the front that kind of tip forward that they're tipping now in terms of when it comes into flight. And again, just a really, really well done um, device, which maybe then goes to show that they have to be stricter laws when it comes to drones. Because these are probably going to fly within the same kind of altitude, I think, as a drone, right? Would they probably fly the same sort of level of altitude? So the drone laws are probably going to have to be tightened a lot more because you can easily see accidents happening if they just allow drones and these kind of, you know, um, commuter drones flying in the air like that without any sort of recourse or any kind of, you know, regulation. That won't be a good sight for anyone. So yeah, the, so far the video has this drone flying across the cityscape, landing on an Uber-branded helipad. And then this helipad kind of lowers the occupants down into an underground garage, which then takes them to their destination. Again, looks really, really cool, man. I'm a big fan of it. I'm, I've got to be honest. I think it looks amazing. Wow. Pretty cool. Again, pretty cool and something that I'm not going to be not be awed by. I'm not sure how it's going. I'm not sure if your regular pun on the street is going to be up for it. I'm not sure if they're going to be something they're going to be down for. But I think for the person out there who is a bit, works in a time-sensitive environment, who needs to close deals, who needs to keep moving. I mentioned, there was a video actually prior to after, which I'm not going to go for again, but in the video, one of the, one of the team that is part of, you know, making this project come to life at Uber mentioned something along the lines of, oh, we envisaged, we envisaged the person that's going to use um, Uber Air, that they're going to use a, a number of other Uber services, whether it's a bike or the scooter or the car to get to one destination place. Then if the traffic is too crazy, they'll then go up to a building where the helipads are, go to the top floor, get in a helicopter, go to the other point of their destination, get off and then continue their journey, which to me seems a bit long, right? To take an Uber to you know, to go to somewhere, I don't know, across town and the traffic's, the traffic's really deep and then you might get a little message on your phone that says, hey, would you like to take a helipad? You click that and you have to go to that building to go up again. It just seems like a long thing to do. I'd rather just sit in a car and get to my destination. But again, Maybe that's just me. Maybe other people want to, if they can shave off 10 minutes, 15 minutes of their time waiting in traffic, it probably is worth it. But to me, the hassle of going up and down stairs or up down lifts and crossing streets is probably not worth it. But again, I think most likely than not, this is really going to be not be, it won't be centered around people who want to get to, you know, one side of the city to the other. It's going to be more centered around people who actually need to get the deals done. Because imagine a helipad in a high rise building will probably be not that far off from where the actual offices from of the executive they're going to meet. They usually got the top floor office anyway. So you're only going to travel a couple of floors down, do your meeting, sign the papers, shake the hands, and then go back in your helicopter and go back to your workplace again. So that'll probably work that way. But yeah, an amazing invention, an amazing innovation. I'm not sure if when it's going to come out or when they're going to roll it out, but this is a kind of CGI um, representation of it so far on YouTube. I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out. But again, looks pretty interesting um next on the list what do we have here ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. what else do we have on the list here next 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 we have amazon prime oh yeah what, this is awesome isn't it amazon prime premier league games have you heard about this wow 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 so um the premier league fixtures just got announced and i'm sure amazon were kind of you know on the edge of their seats waiting to announce it too um, there are a lot of people. I'm, I'm not. I'm not, the, I'm not that type anymore. I think because United are so shit. I think when your team are doing well, you probably care more about the fixtures than you would than you would do. Or maybe when you get promoted, you care a bit more too. But because United are playing so poorly as of late, I've stopped really caring about fixtures. I don't really care. I'm not. I've never really been the person to kind of wake up and oh, the fixture list is coming out. Who are you gonna play? I think when you're winning stuff, it probably feels a bit better, right? You're kind of looking forward to games a lot more. You can't you're specking out the games you're gonna go watch, what away games you're gonna go to, European games, blah blah blah, where they're gonna fit in the calendar. But I think for United fans, we just wanna we just have we just wanna have a decent season. So I think. Our excitement for the Premier League fixture list is probably not up there with everyone else's. But anyway, um, let's say that the better. Everyone else is looking forward to it. And off the back of it, Amazon have announced a really special thing, something that I wasn't aware of, that they will now be streaming Premier League games live on Amazon Prime Video. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. It's amazing. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so far, so the headline says Premier League football live on Amazon Prime. Um, awesome announcement. And I, I use Amazon Prime myself. I think, um, what did they mention? How many Amazon Prime members are there, actually? Um, let me quickly see that if I can see that. That was an amazing stat member seeing. Um, uh, number of Amazon Prime members. 
um, CRP says that today Amazon Prime has 97 million US members, which is up from 90 million users uh, a year ago. It represents 61% of the total US customers. Amazon itself said in April that it has exceeded 100 million paid. Mamma mia, and it's what? The average, what's the what's the average um, price? Like eight pounds? Does it go up from that? Is it more, is it more expensive Amazon Prime or is it all 7 99 Anyway, I've got it, and I think, yeah, 80, 60% of the US have it too. Wow, that is insane. I didn't know it was that much. That is nutty. 60%, 61% of customers, over half. Good job. Anyway, so um, going back to the Premier League. So Amazon Prime uh, Amazon Prime have got exclusive rights to stream some Premier League games during the Premier League season. Fixtures. 20 Premier League games will be live and exclusive on Amazon Prime Video. And I'm not sure about you guys if you watch it, but I know if you've got Amazon Prime, it usually comes with video too. Um, on it, I think even the, the most basic of membership. I use it quite often. I use quite, I watch quite a lot of TV series on there. I've watched um, uh, Dogs of Berlin on there, an amazing European, amazing Berlin-based uh, uh, mob kind of crime drama. There's loads of really cool European dramas on there like uh the departed and a few others i recommend you check them out if you like those kind of things I recommend you do but in general it's quite a good video service i like the video player itself it has that kind of handy feature where it shows you the cast members and who the actors are and what things they've done previously it has quite a cool fast forward option um good subtitles um you can watch it in hd whatever it may be so yeah i quite like the player um so they said they've got 20 fixtures will be live and discussed on um, prime video in december this December, for the first time ever in the UK, all early December midweek games and Boxing Day games will be shown. That is so cool, man. So, of course, these are the games that usually, by that time of the year, people are kind of winding it down and maybe... No, I won't say by time one. You see, was, was the league wrapped up this year? It wasn't, really, was it? No, it wasn't. This is Yeah, these are still crucial games. Everyone's going to be at home um, or going to home or going to their house at that time. Um, yeah, these are all crucial games. Or oh, everyone's going to be indoors and watching it in general. It's just crucial. It's just fucking awesome. So December 5th, 3rd, 3rd, 4th and 5th, they've got Arsenal v Brighton and the rest. And then Boxing Day 26 and 27, which is going to be some big games there. Aston Villa Norwich, depending on how the league pans out for both teams, will be big. Bournemouth Arsenal will be big. Arsenal, Chelsea, Southampton. All these games are going to be big games. Man United, Newcastle's a great game. Leicester, Liverpool's a great game. Tottenham, Brighton's a good game. Wolves, Man City's a great game, considering um, what was happening last season. These are all great, amazing games, man. Uh, Prime members will be able to watch Premier League games as well as other great games at no extra cost. That is insanely good. And this is really good because this comes off the back of bloody UFC deciding the other day, quietly, they announced this quietly too, UFC. They announced they're going to now be requiring, I think from the next pay-per-view, from the next um, card, it's going to be um, pay-per-view. You're not going to be able. Um, you're going to be able to watch UFC fight cards, including your BT um, membership. Because at the moment, I've got BT internet, and I also have the BT whatever online thing, so I can watch football matches and stuff via the BT Player, which is a really good service too. And it included um, UFC cards, but now they're going to require you to pay for the pay per view worldwide, international. Usually, it was just based. It was mostly for the US customers or North American customers. Now it's been rolled out internationally, which is really going to hurt them because I think a lot of because I think you know what I think the UK has probably a lot more casual UFC fans than the US does. People just watch it because it happens to be bundled in free with their subscription. In the US, you really have to go out of your way, unless it's a fight night, to really buy pay-per-view, especially with ESPN+. Plus. People are having trouble having that um, work well. So I think the BT people are going to be a little bit annoyed if it's not included in their pay-per-view. So they're probably going to end up cancelling it. I heard a lot of people kind of protesting about it. Of course, Dana White and Co. won't really give a shit. But um, this is a really good um, counter um, to that. It's all included in your cost of your membership, which I think is about seven ninety nine or eight ninety. I'm not sure. Something un under ten pounds, which is insane to get that many games over that period of time, is really really cool. Um, sign up now, of course. They're probably gonna have a big drive to get people signed up. But yeah, really cool feature. Some announced just the other day. Um, so yeah, all the games over Christmas are gonna be live and exclusive on Amazon Prime. Recommend if you don't have Amazon Prime already, already make sure you check it out. Um, what else is next on here? we got John Cleese's London comments. Really strange, but again, I think I didn't mention this previously. I did mention it previously, but um, fleetingly, but he's made a response video, which I think I'm going to talk about a bit more here. A very strange um, incident happened with John Cleese. I, I think, again, maybe because I've missed out on a few of these things. I'm a big fan of John Cleese. Of course, everyone's a big fan of 40 Towers. But I guess maybe because I've not been that aware of what he said in the past, um, post him being, you know, a a performing actor or whatever maybe he's kind of gone into being a grumpy old man territory it seems that people online 
So maybe because I'm not aware of everything he says, I didn't really take this comment um, that hard. I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. But a few weeks ago, he got embro- he got embroiled in a bit of a public, a bit of a social media storm, which again um, kind of fizzled away after a while, as those things you naturally do. But at the time, John, this as his headline says in the Guardian, uh, John Cleese was critis- um, criticized for saying London no longer is an, in- an English city. Right? He made his tweet himself on his own account, and then kind of people went crazy. So the report says the following: The Forty Towers actor John Cleese has been criticized for repeating his 2011 claim that London has no longer an English city. Cleese 79 tweeted that his friends abroad agreed with his observations, including concluding, so there must be some truth to it. So sorry, he's, he's basically, let me just read his tweet. John Cleese tweeted on May 29th the following. Some years ago, I opinioned that London had, was not really an English city anymore. Since then, virtually all my friends from abroad have confirmed my observation. So there must be some truth to, to it. Um, I note that London was the UK was the UK city that voted most strongly to remain in Europe too, which obviously come, goes to bears what he's saying. So this comment I didn't think was that big of a deal at the time. I thought it was quite a, an, ast- an astute observation. I think anyone that's lived in London for a long period of time has seen it change from the amount of, for- from the even from the, the from the foreigners that are coming in or the immigrants that are coming in. There was a period of time when there was a lot of Caribbean for, um, immigrants coming in, a lot of in- Asian or Indian, Pakistani immigrants coming in, a lot of African uh, immigrants coming in. Then there was a lot of Eastern European, some Central European immigrants coming in. Now you have a lot of people from Italy, France, Spain coming in. Little waves. It comes in waves, right? You see the, you know, the overall... Um, you, you recognize it a lot more in news agents. I think in shops and news agents, especially along high streets and stuff, you notice it because usually you notice it because of the stores that open up and the people that work in them. Because usually those are the jobs that are the most easiest to get. They're the lowest kind of level. Um, what you call it? They require the le- the least amount of skill to kind of get those kind of jobs. So in those jobs, you kind of realize okay, what how the area is changing. And again, it's not a slight. I think you know East Ham has changed for the time that I've lived in East London and East East Ham for the most part was a fairly asian neighborhood or for asian area and that's changed too um you can see a lot of eastern europeans have moved into that area too that's kind of kind of mixed things up a little bit it's just what it is isn't it um i guess with john cleese as well it, what made it more confusing was with me was because he was very adamant that if we if the uk voted to leave the U- eu that he would leave the uk right he wouldn't want to stay in a country that wouldn't want to be part of the european union and he's kind of followed through in it right he's one of the only people in the whole you know political um societal conversation who when they say things actually follow through with it right a number of u.s celebrities when it was uh, looking like trump was going to win were threatening that they were going to leave the states and go to canada but no, not many of them did right one one sticks to mind is lena dunham she was saying she's going to move to canada but she didn't end up moving she's still in the u.s um you know so he's he said what he said he kind of he doesn't really seem like a racist to me he said um, a stupid observation but of course the Twitter space went a bit crazy, called them racist and whatever it may be. Um, I think Sadiq Khan said these comments make John Cleese sound like he's a character. Basel 40, um, London, London, Londoners know that our diversity is our greatest strength and we're proudly the English capital and the European city and a global hub. Which again, he hasn't said nothing against it. Uh, Sadiq Khan's a bit of a virtue signaling anyway. Um, in general, it gets on my nerves a bit with some of the commentary. But again, it didn't seem like anything of a big deal. But of course, people kept going on and on about it. And so much so that John Cleese then decided to come out and comment and actually uh, clear up some of these actual comments that he said. So I've got some of it on here now now which i'll show you which i'll kind of play for you if you're listening via youtube and for you guys watching the YouTube video you'll be able to see it have you ever been on the receiving end of any of this um pc please oh uh, yeah eight years ago i said that London wasn't, uh, that's the funny thing right just stop it there he said it's eight years ago then retweeted it again so he, i'm assuming he got in trouble or he got in trouble on twitter for saying that eight years ago. Then he repeats and says it again now and he gets in more trouble, even though he's tweeting about this from his location outside of the UK or he's on his way to going to his new place, the place that he threatened to go to if we left the EU. Such a weird world we live in, isn't it? Like, really? Like, oh my God. Which is immediately taken as a racist remark. I mean, I'm all in favour of people uh, staying with their culture. If they come to England, you know, they should bring their Caribbean culture with them, or whatever, of course they would. But they should also be interested in the in the culture of the country to which they come. It's an old-fashioned thing that we spend in Rome do at the moment. I mean, if I was going to live in another country, the first thing I'd do is learn the language, and then I would find out a bit about the history and 
Which is very true, right? And you don't really, and again, that's something that happened that we see too often. I think for anyone that is actually living in reality and has gone to a school and have seen people come in and try to assimilate into a new school and the struggles they have with languages, trying to fit in, it's very, 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 very difficult. So I can see the, I can understand or sympathize with um, immigrants that come to the country, especially some of my family who come and have a hard time adapting or assimilating. Especially if you've got a big enough community, I can see the the allure of going into safety and not trying to assimilate and just kind of retreating back and just kind of sticking with your core group. I can see it. But I also see the dangers in it, right? Because when I went to the States, I clearly understood why Trump was going on and on and on and about Mexicans. Because in LA, right, especially if when I went to LA, it was, it's, you know, it's full of Mexicans. They're absolutely everywhere. Every single service job out there, Mexicans are doing, which kind of got me thinking, like, why is this guy trying to demonize Mexicans when they're the people that are literally holding up this entire economy of LA, right? Or holding up large swaths of the United States. But then it also got me thinking, then, it, then I kind of figured out why, especially if you're a xenophobe or you're a nationalist. When I went into in and out Burger and I went to go order a meal, I said something off menu. I think I, I asked a question that didn't pertain to just saying the number of the menu, uh, which kind of, you know, if, if you're, if you don't know the language and someone tells you, ask you something outside of your general kind of script that you know in your head, that's when you kind of get thrown off. I know for me, when I was trying to learn Spanish and you, and you learn Spanish in your book a certain way. So maybe you're waiting for that person to ask you, Hey, what's your name? How old are you? But they ask you, how old are you? What's your name? It suddenly throws you off. Right. And it would happen with the same thing with this girl, young, young, young girl in and out burger, one of the cashiers. She must've been like, you know, probably under 21 and she was stunned she didn't know what to say she turned, suddenly turned around to one of her colleagues in the kitchen and he came back around around and started asking me oh how can i help you and immediately i realized wow this young girl doesn't know how to speak english so she's got this job in the united states she's probably been i don't know there for maybe a couple of years she's at that age where you probably should be able to learn a language pretty quickly at that age right your mind is still quite unquote elastic you're able to kind of absorb new things and learn things quickly on a go and she's not learned the language of course some of it has hands not to do with not simulating there's other reasons behind it but then i immediately understood why i put the connections why somebody like a trump could appeal to people in the middle of america who then see their bank account is on zero they then see all these people who don't look like them getting the jobs that they they think they want obviously that they don't want and then they can't speak english and all of a sudden they make you know one plus one equals a hundred so those kind of arguments I get, again, it's not something that I agree with, it's something that I understand, but I kind, of understand, I kind of get where that weird warp thinking can come from. And of course, the only way to help that is to have an identity as a country, have people kind of, uh, what do you call it, associate with their identity, sort of like the American dream, come over, want to do their best to contribute, right, give back to what, what's kind of given so much to them, raise their children there, wherever it may be, and then kind of, you know, help to lift the economy and have and, uh, and make it a better place for people to come into, right? It's a kind of a cyclical thing, right? It goes, it goes in a circle, in a cycle, sorry. Um, the United Kingdom isn't usually like that. It doesn't feel like that. Loads of it has to do with maybe the government, especially the Tory leadership, you know, they've kind of cut, cut off a lot of social aid, a lot of um, income support for lower income families housing is not really where it should be so a lot of people really stick to their communities they don't really kind of move around right they don't really assimilate or try and integrate a lot of the indigenous community a lot of the people here who co who call themselves english aren't necessarily the most welcoming of people in the world you only have to go to a pub outside of england or outside of manchester liverpool and london bristol and brighton maybe and you'll see the looks you'll get when you walk in and you're somebody that doesn't look like them so there are things that kind of contribute to the kind of weird kind of tension that exists in the uk but it also goes to show why people would vote for the EU, would vote to leave the eu especially if their argument is that they're going to somehow magically make money appear and re and kind of reintroduce jobs that are you know null and void right reopen factories that are never going to reopen i get i get how easily they can be led astray but i don't understand why the john cleese comment of london isn't exactly the most english city could be seen as anything but an observation right you go into central london it's not english you go into East London, it's not English. I think the only parts of England, I think, or London, I think that are super English are maybe the places where you probably shouldn't go, right? If you're not English, um, I don't know, parts of like Bermondsey, maybe, maybe Croydon to a certain extent, but probably not. Maybe places like Slough, Epping, Bournemouth, Islington. Those places are the only places that are slightly, you know, you know, white, white. And those places aren't the most forgiving, you know, of people that aren't, you know, that don't look at people like, you know, you know what I mean. They're a bit weird, those places. 
So I, I didn't really see why it was such a big deal. Again, it just made me wonder, like, what people are actually listening to. Why are they getting outraged? Is it a sport? Is it a recreational activity? But anyway, what do I know? Let's 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 hear John Key's other comments. Culture just fading away because nobody bothers to uh, promote it. But everyone else's culture is more important now. They're all important. Yeah, so what about one big small good culture? For example, a culture that actually turns a blind eye or even tolerates female genital mutilation is not as good as a culture that doesn't. Um, that I'm not really sure I agree with. I think we overestimate. I think I think it's that imperialistic mindset right that which we all probably have maybe even as brits maybe instinctively as an english person this idea that you somehow went around the world and you saved everybody from their abhorrent you know barbarian ways and liberated them and gave them education gave them christianity you showed them a cricket ball and shit and even though you showed them cricket they could still fucking beat you at cricket which is always something that makes me laugh right um <laughs> You go to India, Pakistan, introduce cricket, and they just, they, they, you know, somehow, even though you invented the game, they're better than you at it. It just makes me laugh no end. Do you remember there was a time and period of time in school when people used to tell you that English people invented football? It's like, I, I wouldn't try and fight that fight. That's not a hill I want to die on. Like, English people, it's like, we, we, no, we didn't, mate. We're, I think it's quite evident by the state of our, the state of our team and the lack of, you know, um, World Cups and European Cups we've won in the, you know, preceding, preceding years. But, that aside, I think it might be that kind of imperialistic mentality that makes you kind of overestimate what you're actually contributing and also makes you kind of over, um, to over egg how our culture compared to others. I think, of course, female, gen- female, female genital mutilation on, on the paper, on, on the face of it or in any way, shape or form isn't something that I would agree with or condone in any way, shape or form. But cultures are cultures right they do things that other cultures don't do that are just weird like them i don't know like um those cannibal tribes right that they have in parts of the amazon or like even that tribe what's that tribe on that island that kills foreigners um if they come and try and invade or make contact with them right because they've had some bad experiences in the past that's would you call them barbarians or would you call these people you know or would you call them vigilant for trying to look out for their immediate family that's what i would maybe consider them as to be so there's cultures have different ways of doing things some things are not some stuff some stuff is not stuff that we agree with i'm not really a big fan of people trying to enforce their cultures into parts of the west like sharia law and stuff i think that's just like a no that's like a no-go that is never going to work it's just like i'm trying to mix water and water and oil but i think for the most part to say one culture is better than the other is a little bit short-sighted a little bit again um a little bit nationalistic a little bit imperialistic because you're kind of thinking you know what we know we know how to rewrite the ills of the world you know you have to look at what america's done and look at the state of the middle east you know with them trying to go and trying to enact um and trying to be the police officers of the world and how much that's hurt them the amount of soldiers have died the corpses they've left in their wake um it's not necessarily the best place to go i reckon in my opinion personally <laughs> I like how he's just like when you just when you just an older dude, you just stop caring. Look, it's an opinion. It's why I think it's not right. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just my opinion. If you don't like it, cool, disagree. But I'm not going to not say my opinion. That's what that's what it is nowadays, right? What you might what you said there about. You know, some cultures are better than the others. I don't necessarily agree with it. It doesn't necessarily mean I, yeah, I think you should not talk anymore. It's just an opinion, isn't it? Yeah, I this this is the pit that I really again I'm really making check out the whole video. I'm not going to talk about the whole thing, but because it's a bit long, but I recommend you check it out. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's called uh, John Cleese Philosophy, Spirituality, and Political Correctness, and it's uploaded by the wonderful channel known as Variable Wisdom. I recommend you check that out. But his comment regarding the housing situation in London is really really true. You only have to speak to an Uber driver 
especially some of the Uber drivers that drop me off around here in East London, around Stratford Village, around Westfield and stuff, when I get picked up around there sometimes after a night out. I've spoken to many and many a driver who told me, like, you know, they've kind of looked up at the sky, at, at these new build flats and be like, you know, shaking their head. And like, oh, what's up? It's like, yeah, these places, man, look how nice they are. Look how clean they are. They're amazing looking, blah, blah, blah. But they're always empty. And he says that, like, if you just look up, look how all the windows are completely black, right? And it's like, I don't know, 7 p.m., 8 p.m. at night, you know, usually the time of day when people are back from work, unwinding, chilling, doing their thing, but no one's in these places. And he says that he, he comes back and forth around those areas all the time and he never, and he, he, and he can count maybe on one hand, you might people who's dropped off who actually live in those blocks of flats. Everyone kind of lives in and amongst them. So what ends up happening is that those new build flats, before they've even been built, once their plan position has been secured, they've secured the contractor uh, or the design firm that's going to put them, actually going to put them together, or the, wherever it may be, they already got, they've already been sold to the highest bidder, whether they're um, people from the Far East, whether it's people from the Middle East, whether it's people from Ukraine, Russia, whatever it may be who kind of buy them mostly as an investment, um, sometimes as something to kind of pass on to their children, sometimes just as another kind of, you know, something to add to their overall portfolio. But in general, they don't buy them to live in them. They just kind of buy them and just leave them as they are and just keep paying the rent um, in the background, which, you know, if you've got that kind of money, why not? But then for the people in London who are struggling to secure any kind of housing, especially young parents or people trying to move up in the housing ladder or just people in general that are in council housing that are stuck in that weird little loop of council housing where you don't really have your, your intemporary accommodation because there's no other buildings being built or that when they are getting being built, they're being privatized and being sold to highest bidder. It's a really annoying situation. And that, again, is a, is a, is a, it goes back to the sentiment he shared at the beginning. You know, London isn't, London isn't English anymore because if it was, there'd be some regulations in, in force that would prioritize um, people who are from the city or live there, right, or have moved there permanently. So the same thing happened with Berlin. Remember when Berlin scrapped or changed the rules regarding Airbnbs, right? Nowadays, if you go on Airbnb to try to book an apartment, there's not that many left, especially during peak seasons like now until maybe the end of August. There's not as there's not as many flats as there used to be in the past. Um, there used to be so many flats, and then they they they, they changed the regulations regarding it, regarding who can rent out the flats. Regard, I think you had to be an actual homeowner. You had to be in your name, all that sort of stuff, and it kind of cold nearly half of the flats that were available. But again, that was to prioritize the market for people that actually live there. So people, so foreign investors weren't coming in, uh, buying temporary leases on flats during the hot season, renting them out, cashing the profit, and then running away. Right, that will kind of fuck up the entire housing market. So the government kind of stepped in in order to kind of enact that change. But we don't really have that in the UK, unfortunately. The space as well is a bit messed up. The way we built areas up has been strange, which is, again, I've mentioned loads of times here, the issues I have with the Hackney licensing laws. Most of it has to do with the fact that, not to do with the Hackney, Hackney Council, more to do with the way they built up the, so it's the permission that they allowed most of the bars to open up in residential areas or in areas that are densely populated by other houses, right? Um, they were eager and happy to have all these hipsters come along and lease out these buildings that weren't in use or weren't or just collecting dust. But then once those bars and clubs started to become popular and it turned into a bit of a strip, which kind of led to noise pollution and, and maybe and social behavior all dirt, they got their t knickers and twists and kind of suddenly pulled away the licenses. But it was their fault for giving these giving these licenses in areas where people are living. So it's a kind of twofold problem. So yeah, I, I'm not sure what the issue was with John Cleese. I, I, I'm sure he said other things in the past that have been a bit um, erroneous, whatever it may be called, or erroneous. But I think now this time isn't really the time to kind of um, string him up and say that he should be cancelled. He's an old man. He's kind of he's a he, he's a he's a self-proclaimed intellectual. He likes to be well read. Um, he likes to talk about social issues. He, he mentioned even towards the end of the interview, he purposely likes to troll or to wind people up and say things that are a bit provocative because he knows at the end of the day, it's going to be a storm in an espresso cup, not a storm in a teacup. <laughs> it's going to fade after a while. So again, if you're those people out there who are getting um, recreationally outraged about junkies junkies are saying, take a chill pill, take a death, deep breath. He's not really being that serious. And it isn't that serious really at the end of the day really. But hey, I'm sure they will not listen to me. Next on the list here, Stacy Dooley, white savior. Oh my God. I don't necessarily care about this, but I'm going to quickly mention it because I don't know. I saw it on BBC News. Um, Stacy Dooley. Um, this is a weird one, right? Um, again, because I'm not necessarily a fan of hers. I've, I've watched a couple of her shows, some of her documentaries. I find her supremely boring. Um, she kind of reminds me of a TV version of Zuella, right? The YouTube girl, just, you know, nothing offensive about her, nothing. Um, 
appealing about her just kind of a bit of a bland lady that just kind of you know tries to you know kind of you know people that are bland without a personality and try and do things to make them have a personality right they wear kooky clothes funny trousers do their hair in a certain way maybe use certain kind of slang or lingo go certain places take part in certain activities the permanent gap year student right they're always kind of looking for something when they're going places right looking to find themselves and you know it's just don't have anything in there unfortunately just a bit of a bland um personality bobby but again she does a good job what she does she goes around does documentaries on um on people that aren't as well off as her i'd guess in some way shape or form maybe in some way trying to re you know trying to rebalance the scales of her privilege which i don't know why she does like you could just live your life no one really cares but again you know people want to do things but she got into a bit of a hot water with um that guy that mp david lammy right the one that's always you know rabbiting on about race online and stuff he's a bit annoying he gets him the nerves a bit he's a bit of a virtue signaler and unless and i didn't really get why she bit the bait because i think he's always talking about stuff anyway in general not really doing anything about it he's always got those impassioned speeches where he's about to cry and it's like come on okay cool you're about to cry now what do you know what I mean let's show some action anyway this is a really strange development since the thing so i think she got into some hot bother because she shared a picture on instagram of her with a kid in africa somewhere where she can because i think she's a an ambassador for comic relief so she posted the you know the standard picture that you do when they go to africa like oh my god i can't be super so happy and i don't have anything uh, this is common trope and um of course david lamy got in his soapbox like rubbing on about her and then people were complaining she got into a back and forth which she, i thought she won really she did really well so something along the lines about you know if the, if, it, if this is an issue about me being white why don't you go over there and help yourself in it and of course david lamy had nothing to say he's not going to go and help himself is he because he's going to be oh, i'm worried about my constituent mm -hmm. whatever cool standard thing so since then comic relief has now decided they're no longer going to use um celebrities um to front their campaigns or they're not going to no longer maybe use high profile celebrities which probably is a shame because i guess most of the comic relief um donations probably come as a direct consequence with the celebrities they probably attached to right the celebrity kind of sees it as their kind of altruistic moral responsibility they tweet it all the time they share on the social media they take real ownership of it because they feel as if like you know they live their life you know every monday to friday 365 days in the year all about themselves if they can take out some time in this new year to devote it to other people who are more in need they're going to take it a lot seriously so it's a bit of a shame really like they kind of they kind of what's that a kind of their nose spite their face in a kind of way i'm sure it's going to affect their bottom dollar but it's an article from the bbc it says the following stacy dooley has written a new response to the comic relief white savior row saying her intentions were never sinister which again, I don't think they were. Again, I think she's in t incredibly boring. I think she has no personality, which is why she does these crazy documentaries to kind of somehow, you know, draw something out of her. Again, she's like a TV version of Zuella. But I think for what she does do, for, you know, if you're watching primetime television, if you're like an average, regular, schmegular Joe online, watching kind of, you know, whatever nonsense on TV, it's quite cool to have her, you know, lift the lid on some societal issues, whether it's with youth, whether it's to do with crime, whether it's to do with poverty. It's quite cool to see that somebody at least is doing that nowadays, when nowadays we live in this self-absorbed world where everyone's individualistic, just caring about what's in front of them and not what's going around in the wider, wider sense of the world, or maybe being appreciative and understanding that maybe they're quite in a privileged situation and they should stop moaning. So she serves a good purpose i think in general um she's been criticized of making a film in uganda and posting a picture on instagram of her and a black child comic relief announced yesterday that tv appeals uh will be heading in a direction of not using celebrities okay tv appeals which is again doesn't make any sense because why would anyway stacy says she understands the conversation about people she filmed were happy to with her behavior um in february stacy posted that picture there with her with the with a kid somewhere, I don't know if that's Uganda, says obsessed. MP David Lammy criticized Stacey on her film social media posts. She tweeted him in response saying, David, is the issue me being white? Uh, genuine question, because if that's the case, you could always go over there yourself. Burn, boom, mic drop, he didn't answer back. And that's a question that uh, some black people would find hard to answer. I guess if you're an immigrant coming to this country from Africa, the last, you know, the first thing you're worrying about is make sure you put food on your plate. You're escaping some torrid circumstances, situations back home. You have to look at what's happening now in Somalia to realize what, you know, the 
the volatile nature of some nations in africa so when you're coming here the last thing you're thinking about is giving back home and if you are going back home you're going back directly to your own immediate family because you're usually leaving your house in africa to come to europe to seek riches and gold in order to kind of provide for your family back home and the dream is eventually to go back eventually take your whole family back um back where there is a land of milk and honey right that's essentially what you want to do but um it's hard to answer the question in comparison to a white celebrity because again she's going over there with a full backing of comic relief um bbc other sponsors attaching to her she knows she's only gonna be there for a short time there isn't that personal connection that african people have with that kind of nation where you're going to be a little bit more emotionally attached to it there might be more um there might be more at stake for you if you do fail the criticism will be different if you do fail too from people that are indigenous to the country loads of different um things going on in there right the fact that you know the english have a, 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 essentially an imperial history in africa the african people kind of see white people as a little bit you know above what they are so it may, might allow some things it's a weird conversation but i think in essence her kind of burn was kind of warranted because again i don't think i think david lamby went about it the wrong way he did try and virtue signal he could have just called her directly and kind of spoke about the issue and again i don't think it's that big of an issue i think the whole white savior thing is ridiculous she is really taking time out of her day to go to africa to help these kids to raise awareness, to raise money for a charity that's essentially going to help this local community. She's keeping in contact with them. I don't really see the problem of it in my way, shape or form. But it continues. Um, Comic Relief co-founder and writer, director Richard Curtis announced yesterday the charity would use fewer celebrities. Stacey posted a new picture this morning with another black woman. She loves black women, isn't it, right? I wonder, I wonder if she loves rum and jerk chicken as well. <laughs> um, so he says, um, one of the comments on that picture said at least um this black person is old enough to consent so that issue they had with it that the kid might not consent how many pictures of people how many pictures of people have with other that's ridiculous you have to go through everyone's pictures then people always take pictures of little kids on holiday doing weird things if you go to bali you see a little kid making some weird ornament on the side of the street people always like take i don't know what you're asking them permission as well like bizarre one of the comments are da, da, da. in response stacy said i understand why the conversation that people want to have and i understand that some are saying they feel it's tired narrative i get that what is not okay is people making out we were like somehow sinister in our approach. You know, the funny thing is about this whole conversation. If this was in America, she would have got cancelled time ago. We're a lot better at nuance here in the UK than America, you know. For the SJW stuff that people complain about online on YouTube, we do quite well. I think, um, again, I don't think her responses were that well thought out or that cut in or that intelligent or that well reasoned. She just basically spoke from the heart and said, look, fair enough, right? Maybe the... The optics of it look a bit weird, right? A fairly pale girl, blonde, going to Africa and saving these people. I get it, what it looks like. But I went there with a good heart, right? She's just saying to herself. And people are willing to listen to her and have an exchange. If this was in America, they would have tore her to strips. They would have got some person from Black Lives Matter to go on the stage and talk to her about her privilege and tell her that she doesn't have a voice and that, you know, she doesn't understand, she doesn't get it. And then everything that she said would have been torn to pieces. A, a, a prominent black entertainer would have come out and stuck the knife in as well and wore a t-shirt with fuck Stacey Dooley on it she would have got torn apart if this is America but in the UK for the most part everyone's kind of you know kind of let it be bygones be bygone but again um it's going back and forth it's not going to end she got confronted at some q a session where some girl tried to question her about it and again i don't really want to get into specific of it because again it's quite boring for me personally i don't really see the problem with it um but hey ho you know stay studio is trying to do her thing people don't like it i wish you could get back to a society where if you didn't like the fact that she was funding this charity you just went out and started your own right and just got people that you thought represent that charity better than just maybe trying to de-platform her because i don't think i don't see how that serves anyone the people that need this help the people that are getting and the people that are getting the exposure due to her celebrity which again is gross but it's the nature of the beast they're now you know they're losing out because some person decided that she wasn't quite the right tone of menelin to go and support it's just a weird weird conversation which i don't have any intelligent thing to say about so i'm going to move on um next on here update jason deal adidas i talked about this yesterday and again it didn't show up on the screen because my screen is bullshit but jason deal the skater that i most love someone that i followed since photo simpsons days or maybe even before previously I don't know. but anyway a person that i loved i've met a couple of times um myself one of my skateboarding and styling heroes has got his own adas collaboration which is strange because he was previously on vans and we heard he was an adas and someone told you he's got dropped but then he didn't get dropped and now he's still an adas and now he's got adas shoe but it's not fucking awesome it's a jason deal shoe maybe he's trying to separate them 
both because he wants to. I don't know, but he's got his own Jason Deal shoe. Um, SB or uh, skateboard? Is it a skateboarding? Is it a skateboarding shoe or is it just a? Must be a skateboarding shoe, right? Is it Adidas skateboarding or is it just an Adidas inline shoe? Hmm, interesting, right? If, if it's an Adidas inline shoe, what does that mean for him? Does that mean he's now turned into like a quote unquote tastemaker influencer guy? What does that happen? What happens there? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Article from Hype Beast that says he's got a new Samba. This is the teaser video which I showed you the other day. No, I don't want to make you guys better. Go away. I hate these fucking surveys. Leave me alone. Um, so it's a video that kind of teases it. You see Jason Dill working in his apartment as per usual, sticking up paintings on the wall, drawing on the floor. For some reason, he doesn't have a table. I don't know why. I think he doesn't like using tables. Just a standard thing. Collages everywhere, doing his thing. Then it cuts to some dude running. There's speculation whether or not it's actually him or somebody else because they're saying, surely Jason Dill can't play football. Or maybe his limbs don't move the same way. I'm not too sure if it is. But whoever the person is has their hood up the entire time. So maybe it isn't Jason Dill. But yeah, same uniform on, same outfit on a scrambler, a little one. And then here's him on a skateboard. <laughs> I love Jason Dill. He's so cool looking. Anyway, so that was a video that I showed you guys yesterday. Looked really cool. Wasn't that many details regarding the release of the actual shoe. Uh, apart from the date, which is January, June 15th, sorry. But now we have official images of the actual trainer and when it's going to come out. So these are the official images I've got here for you guys. Um... I, essentially a, a really clean adidas samba there's not much on it about whether or not it's a skateboarding shoe or whether or not it's an actual inline adidas originals trainer i'm not too sure might have to read the description even though the description doesn't say that much tv video is a, da, 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 da. it doesn't say if it's an adidas skateboarding or not i don't think so i just think it's an adidas normally but the shoe is awesome man so here it is adidas Sam jason the adidas samba it's essentially a white and black adidas um all white with black stripes and a black heel tab and deal written in his kind of usual um font on the tip on the sort on the tongue in gold font and it's got a translucent sole at the bottom here which is really nice at first i thought it was gum which would have been perfect um maybe a flip on that maybe if they do another colorway that's black and white with a gum sole that would look beautiful or maybe with a translucent sole that that's that's the same sole that palace used on their first ada skateboarding shoe right do you remember that first that first shoe that palace did I'm sure it was translucent as well, right? Adidas Palace. Um, is it Palace Pro? Maybe it's that one. It's the first one they did back in the day. Yeah, it was trans. Yeah, it was translucent. Okay, maybe not the first one, but this one was translucent. Oh, the Chewy one was translucent. So, do, do, do you guys remember this? So this that. Oh, get off here. That one. Do you remember that one? So there's this one that was uh, translucent. Then there was this one, the Chewy Adidas Chewy shoe. And there was, and then there was this one I'm, I'm thinking about. It was this one that was that was so no, not translucent gum. Can you get translucent gum sole? Wonder if you could, but that's basically what I was thinking of. But it's not the same shoe, but anyway. Um, really nice model Adidas Samba again. For those of you guys who are not, you know, brand loyal and don't mind wearing another shoe, I think this is perfect for me. Again, I'm not sure if my wide foot will fit in them, but I'll try. They look incredible, they look really cool with, um, again, skated in or just in general clothes. Um, we'd like to see someone like an Alex Olsen try them out. I'm not sure, if, is, is Alex Olsen still signed to Nike SB? It'd be cool to see him swagging these out, skating and shit. Um, but yeah, these look fucking incredible. Out June 15th, one of my favorite shoes to drop maybe this year. Really clean, really well done. Again, the story around Jason Dill and the shoes that he wears. He loves to wear indoor soccer shoes, same like Gino and all those kind of dudes. They always kind of pick in really interesting models to wear. Alex Olsen's the same same sort of thing he's always wearing kind of indoor um soccer shoes maybe because of the trip maybe because of the grip and the tread at the bottom but he maybe likes it a bit more sticky some skaters like things a little bit like they slip off a little bit more and he might like a little bit more of a stick on them um no it's not vulcan is it vulcanized is that vulcanized when the show comes over what's the vulcanizer is that vulcanized so i'm not too sure um but yeah ridiculously nice shoe um usually the samba comes with the short tongue and the long tongue right i'm pretty sure they have the tongue that kind of pops over like a football boot i'm pretty sure eh? essentially but yeah um I, I'm, I'm a big fan of these i think they look really cool i'm not sure that i'm i'm hopefully that leather is really nice and really luxe looking and not like the cheapy shitty um adidas i mean shitty kind of nike air force one leather that i have on mine right that kind of shitty leather that kind of thrust up after a while hopefully some nice kind of leather and again, it'll be cool to see other colors of these coming out soon too. But yeah, June 15th, Adidas and Jason Dill coming together, joining forces and delivering on a shoe that we all knew we wanted, even though we didn't know we wanted it. It's fucking beautiful, isn't it? I love it, man. Absolutely love, 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 love. So what's next on the list here? 
uh, Nike running shoes. Ooh, 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 ooh. So I'm thinking about getting some new Nike running shoes. I've been looking at the next four percenters um, that a lot of people have been reviewing on YouTube. Again, I'm not too sure if it's something that I'm going to be able to afford because they're like 300 quid or whatever they may be. Um, but again, dreams are there to be dreamed about, right? But there's these amazing, 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 amazing new shoes from Nike that this reviewer, this guy that I like actually, he's super cool. What's his name? Um, Kuzu Fuzi, I'll check them out. This was a nice one too from Dizin. Yeah, let's check out a video from Dizzy. So I'll put this up on Dizzy, but we can check out another video too. So this is a so this is basically the shoe that I kind of want now at the moment. It's the Nike um, Vapor, the Nike Vaporfly Next Percent, which isn't out yet. I think it's going to be out tomorrow or no, tomorrow or the next day. No, tomorrow. I think tomorrow. Uh, but it's only going to be available to Nike Plus to Nike Run Club members. I'm not using Run Club anymore at the moment. I'm not sure about you guys running wise. Um, it doesn't allow you to sync across your Nike runs on Strava. So now I've just decided to use Strava from now. I'm just going to start pick up from there. Unfortunately, really, because I've clocked up so many miles on Nike Run Club. But hey-ho, what can you do? Um, so essentially, this um, Nike 4% has come out. I the place this short video from the zine that kind of talks about it a little bit more. And we'll talk about it on the other side. Exact same weight as the Vaporfly 4%. Let's put it on here. Video from the zine. Nike Zoom Vaporfly, next 4%. Woo! My name is Brett Holtz, Vice President of Nike Run. Awesome. We are here today at Nike Town London for the launch of the Nike Big wow. Next Percent. This product has been designed and created for all marathoners and it all is so cool. to help everyone achieve their records and break those barriers. It will be debuted on our elite athletes in the London Marathon and then we'll have a broader release this summer. I like how they're releasing them too, right? They've released them super slow. Maybe a similar sort of um, way that they release shoes with influencers in general. They kind of usually seed them out. It, they usually nowadays it's usually a runway collaboration, or whatever it may be. It gets seeded out to influencers, then it gets seeded out to the tier below, then it drops in some places publication wise to get take detailed shots of, and then it kind of gets a release date and then it comes out. So kind of usually about of a six to eight week window, sometimes, right? <laughs> But I like they've really taken their time with these and they kind of, again, because it's a performance shoe and it's not, again, I'm sure a lot of people who be wearing these shoes day to day, but I'm definitely going to wear them to run in, especially if I'm paying 350 for them. I'm going to wear them every single bloody day. They're going to clock up some hard miles. So what they do is that they get them out on actual professional runners um, during something like a marquee event, like a Boston Marathon, London Marathon, um, New York Marathon, Berlin Marathon, all these kind of marquee marathons that Nike usually send their athletes to. And then they kind of iterate it out to all the other people. And then on this one too, I've seen it, featured on loads of running youtubers who have been reviewing it too so they've handled this release really really well but bravo to them for doing that and even these activations inside the nike store having runners come in treadmills and stuff look at your gate all that stuff's fucking incredible really cool well, well done the update here for the nike vaporfly next percent is really just an evolution of that exact same system that really so beautiful look at the tread America. looks amazing don't they i'm even I usually hate that swoosh of the front. That's why I kind of hated the Mercurio Vaporfly thing that Ronaldo used to wear. But I'm not mad at it in general in these. Biggest update really with the next percent is 15% more foam underfoot. Specifically in the forefoot, which is where you're going to get the highest. Mm, not the best idea. You don't want that much foam on your, on your foot, especially if you're going to run the right way. Um, I'm sure they have a technology that's going to... I think a reviewer said, I think the tread at the front of the forefoot somehow push forces you to always try to land on the balls of your feet and not the back of your feet. But I think for actual pose runners minimalist runners and people that actually have good form is going to be a bit of a problem because you're going to sometimes overcompensate or maybe get into bad habits especially with the amount of foam it's got on it but again it probably helps to try and the other thing that's maybe a concern is maybe the absolute the, um, uh, the lack of what's that thing is it vapor fly is it flying it flying it on the outside the kind of cage that holds your foot together usually you have like a bit of flying it on the side of the shoe so when you're lacing them up you're pulling the tension the torsion around your foot so your foot doesn't slide from left to right or roll around they look like they might roll around a bit so then again that might mean that they're more of a race shoe and less of an everyday training shoe but i would like to get some mileage in them myself personally to test them but i don't know just, just looking from the outside in Sandwich in between is that articulated carbon fiber plate. So this is what's giving wow. you that propulsion. I didn't know they had the carbon fiber plate inside. Amazing. Pops you out. I wonder how long that that carbon fiber, what's the um, 
what's the thing called? What's the point of no return when it stops having any sort of bounce on it? I wonder what the mileage is because usually shoes have a, a cap, right, of how many miles they can kind of run through. Usually it's about 100, I think, for the most part. Um, here's Paula Radcliffe talking about it as well. Let's see what she has to say. The elite want from a racing shoe, and that's to be light and responsive, which the plate helps with, and to be cushioning, so to return as much energy as possible to your body without... It looks so beautiful, don't they? Which is what the Zoom X foam does. Nice. We've also gone with an all-new upper. So we're moving from flying it to this new woven upper. This is what we're actually calling the vapor weave. Extremely lightweight. So why not fly it? I wonder why they're literally flying it. Won't absorb water over the course of the marathon. So that allows us to give you 15% more foam underfoot, but actually come in at the exact same weight as the nice. fly 4%. In okay. addition to the upper, we also wanted to increase the traction. So we added uh, different patterns, <laughs> a little bit more rubber for durability. That pattern on the bottom is so gorgeous. The so gorgeous. Really important for any runner. Um, but in particular for a marathon runner, because you're spending so much time... They look really good, man. You have to minimize the shock absorption, give the most energy return that they can, and wow. just make sure that your body can run as efficiently as possible. Ironic, isn't it? She's saying so, that. But anyway, um, really nice shoe. I really want a pair of them. Um, but anyway, um, Pacific, you are talking about, I think they've got a whole range of shoes coming out now at the moment in a similar sort of vein. This is from Hype Beast. Um, it says the following headline Nike unveils a glowing phantom green spring summer 2019 zoom series of silhouettes of shoes so this is kind of taking um cue on what i've just spoken about earlier i'm not too sure if these are the nike if what's this neck percent i'm not sure if that's a neck percent but anyway so they've got a whole range of shoes in the same sort of colorway in that sort of phantom green colorway they're calling it just going to call it lime green for the for the most part to make it easy but this is what they have on screen here as you guys can see um, so you've got this sort of, I'm not sure what that model is there. That isn't a Nike's 10 neck percent, is it? Because this looks a bit different to me than what I just saw in the video. Or am I bugging out? What do you guys think? Is that different or is that, or is that just the same thing? The collar is black, right? The inside is black too. I'm not sure maybe that, that that's the release how it comes out. It's a bit different, right? Because on these ones, you see this, it's all green there. And on that, it's black and the lace. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What's the next ones? The next ones they've got... A few others here too. So a couple of other colorways with Nike Sportswear logo. That's the colorway that it looks like on the on the video, right? That same sort of colorway. Um, again, they look really nice. I love the tread. They've got some other Nike zooms there too at the lower kind of price bracket. I like how they iterated that throughout the entire collection. So yeah, and a whole range of, of colorways and whole different range of models that are going to be available. When are they mentioned it now? They're going to be available June 13th. So they're available today at 12 a.m. Some of them are available only for Nike Club members. The rest of them are available for regular punters. So if you're that way inclined and you're a runner like myself, I recommend you check them out. Um, yeah, I think that might be it, you know. That might be it. One hour and 11 minutes. I'm gone. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been amazing to have you guys again in my company. As always, if you have information, any information regarding myself, sorry, check out the show notes for my website, xnozinga.com. All my links are there. My social medias are at the bottom too. Um, if you're watching via YouTube and you want to leave me a question, make sure you do that in the comments. Subscribe and like and all that malarkey. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review so other people can find the show. But until then, my friends, until then, see you again very, very soon. Peace and take care.